Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, participating. It's encouraging the whole lot. I do not represent my university. I will now try to summarise the take-home points, uh, with particularly from a paediatric point of view. My comments are limited to paediatrics. What you need to know, number one, is that this term conversion therapy is a weasel word. It means that you are on pain of 18 months jail, forbidden from attempting to make a child comfortable psychologically uh, in the chromosomes with which it was born. You are allowed legally to convert it to become a girl, if it was a boy, or genderqueer or whatever, and you look at the web, there's 20 or so gender identities. That is perfectly legal. To go back to the gender identity with which the child was born is now on pain of 18 months in jail. Point one. Point two, what would happen if those children if you did nothing? International research, and everything I tell you is not mine, is coming from other references. International research shows that the majority of these children will in fact revert to a gender identity that in congruence with their chromosomes through puberty, full stop. What can you do to help that? Watch for waiting, somebody says. This is in anticipation that the statistics are going to be realised, that this kid is going to get better. Uh, if you support the child along the way, support what? The next point is that most of these children have been diagnosed with comorbid uh, psychiatric and social problems, most of them. Many of them, if not uh, majority, come from broken homes. Many of them, if not majority, have coincidental diagnoses of anxiety and depression. Autism, for example, uh, even schizophrenia in some of the things. They are very vulnerable children and they deserve our concern and our care and our watchful waiting because they are at risk from all these things from increased uh, self-harm. They are vulnerable children. What happened in the past uh, was that uh, psychotherapy and psychiatry was able to be applied in an individual and in a family way and in an appropriate way. There are standard medicines that the gentleman knows much more than me for depression and anxiety in children. These should be available. These things will now be punished by an 18 month period in jail. So how do we get into this mess? Two things happened. The first thing was the, ar ar the ar arrival, the rise of a new ideology. It's a new ideology that says that there is no such thing as a boy and a girl, no such binary entities that we are all, whether we realize it or not, are somewhere on a flexible locus somewhere in between. And the expression of the sexuality associated with that should be free and easy and unrestricted. Sin in this uh, religious diagnosis comes from the containment of expression of sexuality. Uh, that's the sin, the freedom, the uh, liberation, the salvation comes in identifying with this movable sexuality. There's a new ideology. How did this get control to influence the Labour Party? Only they could tell you. But some people tell me that you have a small group of zealots, they fight like cats and dogs, nobody wants to take them on, no one understands the issue and it's far easier. If they agree with your other legislature, well, yeah, okay, we'll go ahead with it. What else happened? In the 1970s, there was a hormone, uh, some medical science is a wonderful thing often, they were able to get a, a chemical which acted in a similar way to a hormone in the head. A hormone that uh, was produced in the midbrain area and acted on the pituitary and then released another hormone that acted on the gonads to release testosterone and estrogen. They were able to develop a, an analog of that which would in fact ginger the system up but then exhaust the system so that puberty stopped. And this was used with effect uh, in precocious puberty in children. It's also used for effect in uh, males, adult males with uh, prostate cancer, for example, which is driven by testosterone, or in women with endometriosis, uh, which is driven by excess estrogen. So it had a therapeutic application, but then it thought, okay, people in uh, Holland thought this through, well, we'll try this out in these uh, gender-confused children. We will halt their 
purity. Why? In order to give them time to work out whether they're boys or girls or not, and their procreative future. Now, there are three flaws in this, you should understand. The first thing shown by researchers in uh, Glasgow was that these things are not safe and entirely reversible, as is repeated like a mantra in all the literature that comes out of these people. people the researchers have showed if you give it to uh, pubert or sheep, it has an irreversible effect on the limbic system, and those sheep then are much more emotionally labile and lose their way in mazes. What's the limbic system? It's a little bunch in the midbrain there that integrates emotions and thinking and reward and feelings and gives you a kind of internal worldview and identity on which you then make executive decisions to uh, substantiate that. So you are interfering here because that puberty blocking doesn't run vertically from head to gonads, but it goes sideways and it goes sideways to the limbic system and other areas. So you are messing with the limbic system, which causes the child uh, to integrate all these things. That's the first thing. Secondly, it was, also, it was found around about the 1970s that there was a midbrain area which if you uh, stimulated it in premature uh, prepubertal rats, caused an early sexualization and that this was also affected by the hormone you are blocking. In other words, if you stimulated this area, then the female rat wanted to be mounted and the male rat wanted to oblige. This is a primary central area of sexualization which is affected by the hormone which you are blocking. The third thing is that you are blocking the testosterone and estrogen. We all know what happens when uh, males in puberty get the testosterone and so forth. This is the secondary sexualization. So the whole thing is biologically implausible that you could give this to a child to allow it to think through when you have neutered it, you have affected the limbic system, you have ablated the primary center of sexualization, and you have ablated the secondary section, and you're expecting this child to work out whether he's a boy or a girl and how many children he may or may not want later on. It's biologically implausible. It is associated with proven, sustained, uh, side effects. Anything more? Yes. There's recent evidence that if you give it to a prepubertal male, for example, this is a case report, uh, they did an MRI to, at the beginning and an MRI afterwards and his brain didn't develop. There was a structural and a functional uh, effect on that child's developing brain. Now what you're doing when you have ablated that, you have muted the child, is still under the sustained effect of all the authority figures in his life. The doctors at the gender clinic, the social workers at the gender clinic, the psychologist committed at the gender clinic, his mates on the web, the Tumblr websites, all of these things saying, yes, you have done a wonderful thing, you really are a girl, you ought to get on with it which is why, as somebody mentioned, most of these children, according to other people, and almost all these children go on to having cross-sex hormones. Are there things you should know about that? Yes. The proponents for this intervention are happy to talk about increased uh, metabolic syndrome, increased hemoglobin, and so forth. This they do not tell you. They do not tell you about the effect on the brain. It's there for you to look up. Look up Holshoff poll and the MRI studies that they did on the males, for example, you put a male, adult male, and we're not talking about adolescents at the great time of pubertal brain growth, these are adults, put them onto uh, estrogen, what happens to a male brain? It shrinks at a rate 10 times faster than aging after only 10 months, four months. The mantle is diminished and in accordance, the ventricles in the side are bigger, shrinks. Female brain increases. That doesn't mean she gets more new nerve cells or smarter or anything like this. This is a hypertrophy, a pathological thing. These, I was reading just last week to catch up on the literature, more and more of this literature, MRI and functional studies then on what happens when you put a child onto, or someone onto cross-sex hormones. It interferes with brain structure. Does it make them happier? Well, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for this happiness effect. 
Indeed, authors from the Royal Children's Hospital uh, came out with an article in Paediatrics, a major journal uh, last year or so, decrying the fact that there's no evidence to support this. So one branch of the Children's Hospital is saying there is no evidence, and the other one is recruiting 200 new children every year into the process with no evidence. What do we know about it? Well, there is evidence, not mine, this is epidemiological studies, that the rate of suicide in transgendered adults is 20 to 30 times higher than the ordinary population. Proponents for this affirmative business argue, well, that's your fault because you don't accept them enough, well enough. However, this, these figures come from the most accepting countries, uh, Sweden and so forth. So why are they committing suicide? Well, it's as plausible to say that they found no gold at the foot of this rainbow. So they went through a hell of a lot and it didn't make them any happier, point one. Point two, they've got, co like in the children, there is an associated comorbidity of mental disorder. And point three, this is as plausible, I maintain, as anything else. You have put these children, these people, sometimes on blockers, if they were old enough for that, you have messed with their growth and the structure of their brain. Maybe this new brain, which has been affected by the cross-sex hormones, doesn't work quite as well as the other one, and therefore they're not thinking so clearly, and therefore they're thinking that life is simply not worth it. That argument is as plausible as saying it's your fault because you just don't love them sufficiently. What about the surgery, which is the next thing? This is an, an enormous, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's, they say that the mastectomy should be performed because the girl is upset by the size of the breasts. And in the reports from the Family Court of Australia, five girls we know of before the Family Court abdicated its role, two at 15, one at 16, and two at 17. And when this was discussed in the Family Court, what was the argument? Yes, mastectomies are justified because this is not a reversible procedure. As if the human female breast can be uh, reduced to cosmetic appendages that can be approximated by silicon sacs. They don't talk about the side effects in the so-called sexual uh, reassignment surgery, which just rolls off your uh, tongue like as if it's tonsillectomy or whatever, but you are creating artificial holes. Your body doesn't like to make artificial holes. You're trying to extend the plumbing. That leads to leaks. Uh, you're interfering with the sexual organs and that reduces sexual uh, sensitivity. If you're trying to make a vagina out of an inverted uh, scrotum, that's what they do, make a hole, put the scrotum back in the other way. Castration is inherent in everything. And if that's not deep enough for receptive sex, then they add a bit of bowel for the whole business. None of this is really explained. So wherein lies the medico-legal bomb that's going to come? Because there's an increasing number of children and, and the adolescents detransitioning. In London, I was speaking, not London, London, I was speaking to a man in London, Jeremy Hyam, who's prosecuting a case which is now coming against the Tavistock Centre, which is the big centre there for transgendering. Two transgendering people have made a terrible mistake, and they are taking the Tavistock Centre uh, to court for practicing experimental medicine and getting them into this. And everything about this is experimental. Over small groups of medical students, we do research thing. It took over 15 months to get uh, ethical approval to ask mothers, when did you give the child for solid feeds? And I had to give my own mobile number, lest a mother in the middle of the night get so disturbed by this questioning that she needed counseling by me in the middle of the night. <laughs> and yet here, you have got an unproven intrusion by cross-sex hormones, psychological intrusion, uh, the puberty blockers, and the removal of the breasts. How did those hospitals approve that at an ethical level? And what's likely to happen to them? I'm not a lawyer, but there was Whittaker and Rogers case. 
Rogers was an ophthalmologist who acted on uh, Mrs. Whittaker's bad eye and didn't tell her of the one in 12 or was it 14,000 incidents of allergic phenomenon in the other eye in which she, she went blind. The High Court of Australia said that medical practitioners therefore have a responsibility to explain to the person all the known possible side effects. But they're saying blockers, safe and entirely reversible. Sure, cross-sex hormones, they may thicken your blood, but not, not mentioning about, the, about the, the brain, nor do they mention of these side effects. So where are we going from here? I don't know. Somehow or other, we've gone mad. Somehow or other, uh, I can't conceive of an 18-month jail sentence by the politicians uh, interfering then in medical uh, care. And if I was a psychiatrist, I would take this very, very personally because all the work that his profession has brought about, the positive intervention of psychotherapy, and we've got some here, the positive intervention of psychiatry is now brought to naught. This individual and family supportive therapy is now banned under an 18-month jail sentence. 